There's no doubt. And when you talk about uh, tenacity and character, and you mentioned Mark Stone, 61, of course, me being born in 61, I love, I gravitate to Stoney. And uh, just that that whole play where his stick breaks, he checks the guy, grabs another stick, and then gets an assist, kind of yeah. sums up who he is. He's grit. He's uh, determination. He missed 39 games. His first game back was against Winnipeg. He looked out of, out of shape. He couldn't get over to cover Dubois, who actually just signed a big contract, and and angle him. And Dubois scored, and they get buried five to one in the opener. And I'm like, ah, oh, he's they rushed him back just to try and have him on the ice. But lo and behold, you saw him get his stamina and help lead the cup. But yeah, that's that that's a gift when you have players like that 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 go the extra mile. Those first guys to practice, last guys to leave, and they don't have to be. They're high, pay, highly paid. Uh, they're coveted, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, you've got to want it. Chemistry is huge yeah, too. Team-wise sports, team sport, and you got to buy into the coach. Mm-hmm. You have, but you can't have mutiny. I'm, I'm, I'm giddy inside because I feel good energy, and right. you've got, you've got it That's already. From God, man. Yeah, you That's brought it from in. God. You brought it in the house, Beautiful. man, from the start point, man. You were just anxious to get going, which yep. I, which I enjoy. But I feel like that's source God is one thing. But as I understand your length and the duration that you've been in the sports world, mm-hmm. the natural place that I go with that, Ken, the question becomes is how does one get so involved in sports like you have? Like what's the catalyst? Right. In the journey at some point, because I read somewhere too that you were on a Navy ship and yeah, that's, that's kind of when you started, started messing yeah. around with it. But are you there because you're obviously in the military, but then you were a sports player, sports fan before that. Right, and then right, you start right. flirting here. Right. Walk us down that path, man. Okay. Oh, are, are we going? We're going. Now? Yeah, oh, we're, we're going, going, man. We're in it. We're in it, man. I thought we were just yeah, starting. Yeah, okay. No, no, we're in it. All right. So here's yeah, the yeah. thing. Uh, Jersey, it's funny because my growing up, my buddies would say, uh, their parents would say, don't hang around that Thompson kid. He's bad news. Meanwhile, my parents are like, don't hang around those kids. Are bad. So we're all like, we all got in trouble collectively, right? Yeah, we're yeah. not bragging about it or anything. But, you know, here I am 17 years old and I have a choice. You could go to juvenile home or you could join the service. Mm. So I was like, all right, that wasn't an easy decision. Let me join the service. To get in the Navy, you had to have a high school diploma. Mm-hmm. I did not have one. So I suckered my buddy into driving me down to Ocean County College in Jersey. I had to take the GED. He goes, how long is he going to be? He goes, eh, about five hours. He goes, well, what am I going to do? The lady's like, take the test, right? So here he is. He's getting ready to start senior year. And so he takes the test. We both passed. We got our test results back in about four days. So I con him into go, hey, if you go in with me, they'll guarantee us our first duty station together. Our goal, get to Cali. Let's get out of Jersey. Let's get to the West Coast. So we're guaranteed San Diego, Hawaii, or Long Beach. So we go. There we are, aircraft carrier. We're going to be in North Island, Coronado, in California. But our ship, the USS Ranger, an aircraft carrier, is out in the Indian Ocean. So we have to pick up the carrier there. So I'll never forget, drive from Jersey, JFK, New York, fly to San Francisco, fly to Alaska, fly to Japan, to the Philippines. Bad news, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Cairns, we're sorry. The fog is too heavy. We cannot helicopter you out to your carrier for the first day. Well, you're going to have to stay here in the Philippines. We're in Angeles City. Greatest time ever for an 18-year-old kid, right? Just turned 18. Most beautiful women. They gave us from dispersing $50. $50 at that time was worth $500, right? right? In the the pesos there or whatever that they were using in uh, in the Philippines. And just had a great time. So the next morning, we're ready. We're there. We're going to go catch our ship. They go, bad news. It's still over. We cannot get you out there. We should be able, everything should break. We should be able to get you there tomorrow. Another day, go to disperse and get another 50 bucks. Night on the town for 18. So we're thinking this is going to be a great time. Uh So part of the deal though, was we were bosun's mates, which is basically a glorified janitor. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're chipping paint, you're painting, you're doing unreps, you're bringing supplies on all the stuff, grunt work. About two years into my service, my buddy, Steve Cairns, he started uh, looking into data processing because he wanted to get out of the bosun's mate rate. So my other buddy goes, hey, why don't you uh, go out for that sportscaster job? I go, what? He goes, he goes yeah. He goes, they got a So on the carrier, they have a regular two camera operation. It, oh, yeah, about 6,000 guys on the ship, right? And so I didn't even know about it. But the guy that was doing the sports got transferred. Huh. So there was an opening. Okay. And they had already talked to about you know, 40, 50 people. I went up there. I was like, the last one, I was like, hey, can 
this chief, Chief Versailles, gives me a 20 question sports quiz. I got 19 of them, right? I think I might've missed a ladies track and field question or whatever. And uh, so there I was like 19 and a half, 20 years old. And I became the sportscaster on an aircraft carrier and there's no computers or anything. So I'm out in the Indian Ocean and there's what's called a teletype, one of those automatic typewriters, right, 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 right. just giving you the news mm-hmm. as it's coming across from AP, Reuters, everything. So I'm reading, well, naturally being the sports guy I am, all of a sudden USC football is playing. I've been an SC fan forever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, third quarter, USC seven, UCLA six, whatever. And it, it's going like play, touchdown pass. That it's all. So I'm staying up all hours of the night. The time difference between the states is 17 hours mm-hmm. or somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. And so I'm getting all these scores and following all this stuff. And then I, of course, also wrote the sports page on the uh, Ranger Gazette, they called it. I had no idea that I was getting Sunday's football scores Saturday. Mm. I could have been, sure, I'll take the Raiders. I'll give you 10. Wow. Because I already knew the score, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank God I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Right? Would have been man overboard, man overboard. <laughs> but no, that was where I started. Uh, I, Manny, really, I drove my dad nuts when... Uh, when I was growing up because he was, he was from Brooklyn, okay. big Brooklyn Dodgers guy. Okay. Jackie Robinson was his yeah. guy, Pee Wee Reese, yeah. color Barry, all that stuff. And so, but I, I took it over the top. Like I'd follow every game, every score. I was a Mets fan because my dad hated the Yankees because mm-hmm. the Yankees always beat the Brooklyn Dodgers uh-huh. in the series. And a uh, crazy story real short. My last name is Thompson, no P. It's the way Bobby Thompson, who hit the shot heard around the world, spells his last name. Sure. My dad living in Brooklyn as a, let's see, it was 1951. So he was 24 years old. He started putting a P in his last name because he didn't want his Italian buddies to kick his ass because he spelled his name <laughs> the same way as Bobby Thompson from the sure, Giants that sure. beat the Dodgers yeah. and cost them the, the World Series. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, 1955 is the only year the Dodgers, Brooklyn, beat the Yankees in the series. So I have the commemorative jersey, all that stuff. But uh, yeah, here I am, 18, 20 years old now, and I'm the sportscaster on a carrier. So stay in the service, get out. In early 80s, mm-hmm. uh, we were actually the center of the battle group. I, you've probably seen the movie Argo. Uh, How old are you at this point when right, you get out? Uh, I'm 21. You know, 21, I, I'm not out yet. Okay. Uh, so let me see. Almost 22. I'm just okay. getting out. I'm 22 years old. So my goal, our goal was let's stay in Cali when we get out, right? That's our whole goal. Get out of here. My buddy goes back and I stay out in Cali and I rough it and work the restaurant jobs, whatever I could do, you know, got in the industry. How I get to, uh, I win a model search competition down in San Diego that my girlfriend got me into. I signed with Wilhelmina West, big modeling agency, yeah. and uh, Philip yeah. Carr uh, from, a, uh, he, was a, um, he was there. And then uh, there was an acting agent. Uh, that, I think it was Philip Carr was the, the acting agent. So he's like, if you can, if you can act, you're going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And if you can't act, you're probably still going to make a lot mm-hmm. of money. So I end up going up there and... Uh, you know, got into that, ended up working jobs, odd jobs, restaurant jobs up in LA, yeah. warehouse, restaurant, Marina Del Rey, still there. Yeah. Great place, great times. <laughs> and uh, so I, we used to play ball. I play hoops. I'm, I'm still a hoopster. Uh-huh. I'm 61 now. I just got done hooping wow. at Lifetime Fitness this morning. Yeah, that's amazing. I still can shoot the threes yeah. with the best of them. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm out on the court in Venice Beach and white men can't jump. This is right before the movie came out. So we played there all the time. So we knew the double rims. On the weekends in Venice, everybody else would come out from all over, Manny. Mm-hmm. So I'm watching these guys warm up that we're going to play. And these two brothers, actual brothers were from Chicago area. And the young guy that's going to cover me or supposed to cover me, six, four, he's like dunking over behind his back. And I'm like, I go, this brother's not going to cover me. I go, he's looking at me like white. He's got nothing. Right. <laughs> I am the only white guy playing. There's a Mexican dude on our team. That's really good too, that we played all the time together. It's a little point guard, Jerome. I don't know his last name, but he had the little tail. This is late eighties, right? Mm-hmm. Best from Flint, Michigan, this kid could take anybody to the rack, right? He lefty, ambidextrous, was great. But my nickname's The Grinch. Long story, he took this kid's Christmas present. He found it at my house back in Jersey. So he's like, oh, you're leaving The Grinch open in the corner, dude. You have no clue what you're doing. But so younger brother's cheating over with older brother because Jerome's taking him hard to the rack. He whips it to the corner. So I hit the first three corner jumpers. So they're coming down the, uh, the court and the older brothers who's shorter, stockier, you chiseled though. And he goes, hey, stay on Whitey. He's got shot. So younger brother's like, yeah, yeah, I got him. I got him. Next time, next two times down the court, same thing. And Jerome's like laughing. He goes, yeah. you have no, he, this dude will make 10 in a row from the corner. You have no idea. So he whips it to him. So after I make the fifth one, older brother's had it. Mm-hmm. Even though he's shorter than younger brother, they're coming down the court. He pulls him down by his T-shirt from the collar. And he goes, 
who the F is covering Bird in the corner? Because his back, like sure, Bird sure. and Magic Johnson yeah. are going at it yeah. all the time. And it's just, so there's this skinny brother that's, uh, he's got a tripod. He's filming the whole thing. Venice Court, first, first court, uh, Venice Beach. And uh, look like Spike Lee. So I'm done playing in, uh, I think it was like eight, eight of 11. Like one of those games, like you're like, thank God. Thank oh, you, man. God. I'm glad. First court, everybody's in the stands. Watch. And I just had one of those games. But you're going to leave me open. I can't shoot. And uh, so this guy goes, hey, uh, where'd you learn how to play ball? I said, you know, Jersey. I said, my great uncle coached in Brooklyn. I said, I, I go to all the games. I saw guys like Connie Hawkins, old school guys, uh, you know, back when I was growing up that made it into the NBA. And I said, I, I don't have great handles. I said, but I can play D, I can box out, and I can shoot. You know, he goes, I know you can shoot. I saw you shooting. And uh, he says, do you want to read for a lead in a movie? Hmm. And I said, I said, I said, yeah, what's the movie? He goes, well, are you union? And I go, yeah, I had just gotten my SAG home fitness from doing a Joe Weider home fitness gym commercial. So I just gotten my SAG card about three weeks earlier. I go, yeah, I'm union. He goes, it's going to be a real low B budget movie. He goes, the name of the movie is White Men Can't Jump. Oh, man. And his brother's telling me that. I go, come on, man. Yeah, I go, and, and you know, and, I, and a lot of my good friends are black. And I go, yeah. I go, and, and the sequel is Black Men Can't Swim, right? <laughs> and, he's, and he's laughing. He goes, no, no, I'm serious, man. He goes, it's a real low B budget movie. But, you know, so I went on like three callbacks. I know I got the part. Wesley Snipes don't know who he is, mm. but he gets the script from somebody. He ends up reading it. Not only does he want to be the black guy, but he invests some of his own money into the budget. Mm. His only stipulation, the white guy had to have an established name. That's how Woody Harrelson enters the picture. Woody liked the script. Woody's there. I'm X'd out. I did a couple extra scenes, wow. but my name wasn't established. I had gotten my union card, yeah, but yeah. so is what wow. it is. But yeah, all that stuff. God takes you on crazy trips sometimes through life. And you're much younger than me, Manny, but I've been in Vegas now for 23 years. Uh, I was in Cali, I think, for 18, 19 years. You know, you're growing up in Jersey. Mm -hmm. I am so blessed. I've met yeah, so man. many great people. And people look at Vegas like, oh, it's Sin City. Yeah. It's Sin City. Everywhere is Sin City. Yeah, Vegas yeah, yeah, just, yeah. it's out there more, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can hide your sins. doesn't much matter. God knows all is where I come from. So end of the day, there's no better place to live. I love yeah, Henderson. Yeah. I love Summerlin. And I love all of yeah, Vegas. Yeah. I love the Strip. Love the downtown. But as locals, we don't go to the Strip too much because yeah, yeah. we know the traffic yeah, hazard. Yeah, yeah. Right? Especially now, man. Right. I mean, it's just, it's wild. Dude, that's fascinating. I I don't want to let more of that storytelling escape us, but I do, by the way, fantastic, man. I love, I love I what you I'm got, hearing you so You got far. a job to do, so go ahead. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, no, 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 okay. no. I, I, by the way, my, my approach is never to, to uh, sort of control or dictate how it goes, because right. I think what comes out of it is exactly what we're here for is perspective yep. and understanding of you and journey and story and improvement quality of life. And there's just different variables that are involved in the discussion. Right. So, but in this case, cause I got, ex I got excited. So selfishly we were going, we're in California. Uh, white men can't jump doesn't happen. Woody Harrelson takes the the role, and then what? You go you go and start flirting around some more in Hollywood, trying okay. to figure out what to do next. So like, here it is: Y two K. Y two K. I'm in Anaheim Hills. I'm calling games for Long Beach State basketball. I'm their play by play guy. How do you get to this point? How do you get from white men can't jump, and then and then into I, that role there? Right? What, like kinda, what happens I, there? I kind of had a yeah. I found out some of the stuff, and for, for those that follow Harvey Weinstein. And his saga, what's happened in Hollywood, the behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff, I kind of found out some of that stuff on my own uh, in the modeling industry. Uh, and uh, I ended up getting out of it. Okay. I ended up doing local stuff, but I had canceled a trip to go to Milan, I had all the stuff, just finding out stuff that happened. And I wasn't into that. And I was like, all right, I know I'm going to miss out on a lot of boatload of money. But there's certain things that I don't compromise. It's like a values thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. So okay. more, you know, just, just who I am as a man. And uh, so I, I let that stuff go and it hurt, mm. but got into the restaurant industry and, and, and thought I still might have a shot at acting. But I was like, you know what? Sports is my first love. Mm. I said, let me do. So I went to a sportscaster camp and I couldn't even afford to go. But I ended up setting up the heads feds. Roy Engelbrecht did a sportscaster camp, Loyola Marymount. Uh, over there. And I lived not far from there, Westchester. So I went there and I got into that. And, uh, you know, so I end up getting, getting a job, uh, somehow Long Beach State's play by play guy leaves in the middle of the season. I end up getting that job. So there it is. Y2K and, uh, 2000 and my buddy that's, uh, sharing the building with the radio station KPLS that I was doing the Long Beach State games on. And I also sold airtime for him. 
And he goes, he goes, what are you doing for uh, New Year's Eve? I go, ah, I'm probably just going down to the local place. This is Anaheim Hills, mm-hmm. right? And he goes, right, right down the street. And he goes, you want to go to Vegas? Vegas. I go, you ain't getting near Vegas on Y2K. What are you nuts? He goes, no, no, no. I'm rated. I'm rated at the Rio. He goes, I'll get us the rooms and the, and the flight. Mm. He goes, you, you pay for the cover at, at the club. I go, deal, man. Yeah, I go, are yeah, you yeah. kidding me? The rooms are like a thousand a night. I yeah. go, are you kidding me? So you get Ron Frumkin was his name, uh, owner of uh, some business there that was in the building. So we go there and uh, I'm like, this is great. So I go down to Club Rio to pay, right? And I'm thinking, ah, it's going to be 50 bucks, you know, Y2K night, maybe a hundred. Uh-huh. Like, I think it's like 200 yeah, yeah, to cover. Yeah, so I pay yeah, for yeah. that. I'm going, man, he must have, he knew that. But still, what he's paying, what I'm paying is nothing, right? Mm-hmm. So we're there at, at Club Rio. It's Y2K. Here it is. New Year's coming. In. It's about, eh, about 1030 and it's dark in there. And I'd given the gal my credit card. And I had like, I'm on my second Long Island, right? I'm like, Y2K, yeah, yeah. I'm having, Ron doesn't even drink. So he's on, you know, drinking Diet Coke. So I said, man, I said, the lady goes, do you want another drink? I said, man, I better check and see how much these are. They could be 50 bucks, a hundred bucks a piece. It's Y2K. I don't know. So she goes, well, your bill's at $148. $148. I go, this is only my second Long Island. I go, how much are these things? 60 bucks each? I go, my buddy doesn't even drink. She goes, she goes, no, they're only $21.95, $21.99 a piece. I go, so, so something's wrong. I go, cause my buddy's th- that the only other one drinking. He's on the, she goes, well, he's on his 11th diet. He's, he's drinking diet Coke. He's on his 11th diet Coke. They're like $10 a piece. I'm go, I go over, I go, bro, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven get you a double big gold, man. What are you doing, man? You're jacking my car. So I was like, all right. So he calls that. So that night it's a, like the, it's a little after midnight and everything. So I'm going, I'm playing blackjack. Mm-hmm. And it's like one of these nights that, I mean, I'm hitting big time. The dealers are breaking. Didn't matter what dealer. I know we all have our, oh no, I can't trust that dealer. I can't trust that dealer. You know, it didn't matter. So I bet for the dealer, right? And I, so I'm teaching these people how to bet later on in the night. And uh, so I'm yelling out, the dealer turns 14 and I'm like, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, 10, 24, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, his number was 24, right? So all these people are there, a bunch of ladies, uh, two Asian ladies down the, cause I didn't get to play anchor seat. They're down the anchor seat, but they see me betting for the dealer and it comes up 16. I'm like, Dave Kingman, Dave Kingman, Dave, Dave. 10, 26, Dave Kingman wore wow. 26, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm leaving like four la- four hours later, I'm coming back from like the, you know, the bathroom and I hear these little, these little Asian ladies, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, uh, Dave Kingman, they, they, like they have no idea who these guys are, but they know it's going to be 24 <laughs> or 26. Right. The dealer's going to break. Mm-hmm. So the pit boss comes up, real nice lady at the Rio. And she goes, I just want to thank you because you taught these people how to bet for the dealer. And so mm-hmm. when we're winning, when the dealer is breaking, they're, they're, their people are getting sure, paid because sure. they're paying off their bets. Right. And so they're making bank because these mm-hmm. dealers, I'm telling you, you don't have a night like this. They, they're breaking 80% of the mm-hmm. time. They're showing four or five or six. Wow. They're on 14, yeah, 15, yeah. 16. They're breaking yeah. every time. And so I never forget the pit Y2K and the pit boss. Real nice. I said, do me a favor. Let me know when it's almost 8 a.m. Because I want to go bet on Purdue. Drew Brees' last mm-hmm. game wow. against UCLA. Okay. So she says, okay. She comes back later, comes back later and, uh, and, and she's like, Oh, I, I, I forgot. It's uh, it's about seven after eight. You, you wanted to get, I go seven after eight. It's a citrus ball from Florida. It starts oh, yeah, at 11 a.m. Yeah, 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 I'm like, that. I sprint to the sports book. I get there and go, oh, that just kicked off. Ugh. And I'm watching Drew Brees and Purdue. <laughs> and they're up 25, nothing Ooh, at the half. Be- and I'm dying. And so now I'm kind of a little ticked at this pit boss, this lady who's so nice to me all mm-hmm. night. And I'm like, dang, man, you just cost me, cost me 500. You know, I was going to bet 550, sure. 500. Make a long story short, you never know how God's going to save you. Mm. UCLA outscored him 28 wow. nothing in the second half and beat him. She saved me 550 yeah. bucks. Here I'm getting mad at her for costing yeah. me 500. Yeah. She actually yeah. saved me 550. So it's crazy stuff. Yeah. That night, though, I met a beautiful cocktail waitress, connected with her, and I ended up marrying her and having a child and moving to Vegas later wow. in, in uh, Y2K in 2000. Unbelievable. Yep. So that's how long story short. Cool. So that's how you end up yep. in Vegas. That's exactly. And wow. that is Mark Advent's sister, Karen, that I married. Incredible. Yep. Incredible. Unbelievable. What's funny about that story is that when I was younger, my dad used to bring home the parlay cards because right. he worked at the Stardust. He worked at a lot of different casinos. The Stardust was yeah. legendary. Yes. Legendary. Yes. I, used to, I, I tell people I used to live there because yeah. he would take me there. I would sit in the coffee shop and then I'd go get my hair cut there by uh, one of the ladies that would cut the hair there. But he would always bring me home the parlay cards. And right. so 
funny because I would, I would, he would let me pick the teams and yep. do the homework on the teams okay. and then place, uh, not place the bet. Obviously he would take the money and go place the bet. But I remember being on Saturdays and Sundays watching college football. Cause we would do uh, 10 teamers yep. on the parlay oh. card. We would do five college and five pro to okay. kind of even yeah. it out. And I would sit there and to your point about Purdue and UCLA, UCLA, right? Yeah. It was, it was like, I would be winning a game and it would be like 42 to nothing. And then fourth quarter would come and the team that I didn't want to win would come back and win. And I'd be like, this sucks, man. Or cover like, like, or something. Yeah, right? yeah, or cover something at the end. stupid. Like, what, what, what's happening? How does something that happen? so <laughs> stupid. And so yes. I realized like I was creating this problem inside myself where I was like, depending on these wins. And then I realized how real gambling was. Yes. Where you'd never know. Yeah. You just never know. Like you can do a good job to prepare and understand and, mm-hmm. and, and do stats and stuff like that. But um, yeah, man, that was funny. And you saying that. Okay. So you make it to Vegas. Yep. How do you start leveraging the skills, the sports, the broadcasting, Long Beach, and all of that and packaging it into what you end up doing out here? Do you start right when you get to Vegas and get into more sports casting and broadcasting? Or are you sort of finding your way through? through yeah, the, no, through I, the need, I needed way? to make money. And okay. there was a company, NOS, back in the day. This is early 2000. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, in the article in the, in the want ads, 1442 an hour plus commission. So everybody's going to go check it out. Sure. I know I can, I should be able to sell. Da, da. It was business to business, long distance. Oh, okay. So you got in a sales. nightmare. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it was crazy. I mean, and you could, and some of their methods, let's say were not above board, mm-hmm. found out later. And so that, that hurt me because I never want to rip anybody. I don't mm-hmm. want to be a used car salesman, mm-hmm. so to right. speak. Not that there's, a, there's a lot of good, honest used car salesmen. Sure, sure. But for the bad ones, they've given it a bad name, yeah, you know, right? Totally. And you don't ever want to. And because I can speak and have spoken for a living yeah. and speak fast in the Jersey and all that, you don't want to come across as a BSer, right? Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you're, you know, that you're above board. My word, you know, is golden. Yeah, yeah, and I still, you know, we're old school. So still a handshake mm-hmm. means something. You look somebody in the eye, yeah. handshake. Yeah. yeah, I get it. You have to protect yourself with yeah. all types of yeah. contracts. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. but yeah, I was still calling Long Beach State games Thursday and Saturdays. I would drive to the pyramid and drive back in, insane wow. and, and call games. You mean the Luxor? And, no, no the, the pyramid in Las Vegas and uh, Long Beach. Oh, that's, wow. That's where Long oh. Beach State plays. They play at an actual pyramid okay. and it's, uh, that's their arena and stuff. So I was still calling their games, wasn't making Jack as far as money, but it was because it was my profession. So I had off Thursdays and Saturdays and I would drive to the games, drive back. And then I'd have to drive out of town sometimes. If we played Reno, you, cause UNR was in our, mm-hmm. or if we mm-hmm. played Pacific, I drove to Stockton. We played Utah State, I drove to Logan. And so, you know, cause I couldn't travel with the team anymore because mm-hmm. I wasn't living. Right. In Southern Cal, I had moved here and I needed a job to make sure I was anyway, long story short, I ended up taking another job as far as selling these sports pagers. Uh, and it was a pretty good job sales manager. And in the same building was a good friend of mine, Chuck Edel. He's a good friend now, okay. but he was selling sports plays you know, picks and they'd call people that were betters. And this is back when Vegas is really, you know, people had bookies and whatnot, but they're, they're paying for your plays. And so I ended up teaming up with this guy, Chuck, and he became my first partner on the radio, Bob Scucci over at uh, Boyd Gaming, who's still okay. in charge of all the sports at Boyd okay. Gaming. Bob gave us an opportunity. Coastline Sports was our first show on 1400 KSHP, Incredible. still here in town. Yeah. And Brett Grant, God rest his soul, was a, a great general manager. And so started doing a Friday night show and then got it going to five nights a week, was on uh, on 920 AM. And now I've been on uh, K-Dawn, which is the actual, the oldest station in Vegas. I've been on K-Dawn now 15 years. It's my wow. 15th year on K-Dawn. It's now 101.5 FM mm-hmm. and Odyssey acquired it from BZ Broadcasting. So Odyssey is the second largest, I believe, conglomerate behind iHeartRadio. Oh, wow. And so they own it now. And the Odyssey app is worldwide, A-U-D-A-C-Y, the Odyssey app. So okay. that's where I'm at now. Yeah. Monday through Friday, five yeah. nights a week, eight that's to 10 fantastic. p.m. And then Sports X Radio is the show. Yeah. One yeah. one word, Sports X Radio. But yeah, that's how I yeah. got to Vegas, was marrying a beautiful lady that I met on Y2K. <laughs> And here I am. And I got, you know, amazing, incredible. My daughter, Kiara, Mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. 22 year old was born uh, January 16th. 2001. I'm the 19th. Are you? January 19th. There you yeah. go. Yeah, man. She, and she's a beautiful yeah. soul, man. Just like, just like you are. Good Randy. for you, brother. Right on. Dude. All right. So we're going to bookmark the point of coming to Vegas and sports X radio there, okay. but I always like to explore I look at you, I meet you, 
I listen to you and I think you said it. You said I can speak. I do it for a living. I talk fast. I actually had those thoughts a few seconds ago. And I look at someone like you and I think that you're different than me. And it's funny because I actively work on this thought process in my head where I always wonder why if I try to speak fast, that my mind doesn't permit it. It's just not who I am, right? right? I right. have to slow down. I think I think it helps me in a lot of ways. Right. For someone like you, what would you say someone can do to help themselves be better at that part of life, whether it's communicating, speaking, getting their message out, number one. And then the second thing on top of that that I want to kind of allude to is that is your sports knowledge a function of deep study and passion for it? Or is it some other almost unique ability that you have to remember things? Because I'm like, mm. damn, yeah. like I have a hard time remembering what I did yesterday. Right. Again, maybe it's because I did a decade's worth of drugs and sure alcohol and all that stuff in my you yeah, know, But you phase. can't take that because I've done, I did, well, know, so if it, I, I did two and a half decades worth. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. so then I can't use that as right, an excuse no, anymore. I'm not going to so you out there. So I find it fascinating that those, those two things happening there, I look at them and I'm curious more about your take because I find that almost like a superpower, both between the ability to speak like mm -hmm. you do and fast and collect the thoughts that quick. And then also the memorization of all the sports stuff. So please, man, walk us into some of that stuff. I'd, I'd love to hear your take on all that. Yeah. The sports, the sports knowledge, like I said, because I went at it as a kid, you know, remember there's a, as a kid, there's, there's no computers or anything. Mm -hmm. So I remember like my dad would go, all right, like pick out a book. And I would grab the almanac. He's like, what are you reading the almanac for? Because you can't read the almanac. But there was a sports section okay. and I'd go back and have all the records, all the baseball, all the, I mean, all the stuff. And I, I'd, I'd sit and I'd, I'd memorize it. And then Sunday paper, we didn't get the paper. I had to sneak across to the Radleys, sit on their milk box. And then three days out of the week, I'd pocket that sports page. And I'd hear Mr. Radley going, God dang it. Where's our sports page again? <laughs> For Thompson kid for you taking our sports page, especially on Sunday. Cause that's when all the baseball averages would come mm -hmm. out. And that was like, that was golden. You didn't have all these computers and everything yeah, there yeah. at the ready. Yeah. Right. I mean, everything you had to have up here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, 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 you know, that was just something, I, I think it was the way I grew up, uh, the love for all the different sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, those four, you know, growing up in the New York, mm -hmm. New Jersey, I was in North Jersey. Yeah. So my dad was in New York Rangers, loved hockey, loved the Knicks. And my great uncle was a basketball coach in Brooklyn. So we'd go around the five boroughs mm -hmm. and I travel, uh, and, and then baseball again, my dad's favorite because back in the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, baseball was King. I mean, before the NFL really got going. Right. So, and my dad being from that Mecca, because it was the New York Yankees, New York Giants, Brooklyn Dodgers. So the Dodgers and Giants would battle to see who would lose to the Yankees, really, in the World Series most of the time. So, right. uh, And then uh, football was coming in, and it was the Jets and the Giants, both in New York right there. And now, of course, they both play in Jersey, mm -hmm. in, 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 in North Jersey and stuff. So uh, all of those all of those teams, all that stuff. So that was, that was the one thing. Just I, I think I have a natural ability. Now, my memory is much better. I can go back to the 70s and 80s. A lot faster and memorize everything. I know everything as opposed to 2016 or 2017. I don't remember. I don't. Mm. I know who they are. Right. I know all the guys. I can tell you every guy on the Raiders front line, both sides of the ball, and, and the roster's changed over. Uh, ironically, I just ran into Derek Carr on Sunday at a men's prayer. Wow. Uh, amazing. Yes, yeah, still in Vegas. Wow. Uh, Derek. Derek still has his house here. Okay. So he's with the. And I told him. I said, ironically, out of all teams, you're with the Saints. <laughs> I mean, because that's who he is. He's yeah. a football player. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a man about God. That's first and foremost. Right. That is who Derek Carr is. Mm -hmm. And uh, for him to be there, just praying with about 35 men at the church, Las Vegas over there. Pastor Benny Perez, East L.A. kid, outstanding pastor. And people don't know uh, Las Vegas has more churches per capita than anywhere in the country. Wow. And I know people call us Sin City, mm -hmm. but there are some amazing mm -hmm. churches. Judd, Judd Wilhite, Christy, Central Christian Church, biggest church here in the Valley. Judd's a good friend. So, I mean, a, a lot of beautiful souls here. We're very fortunate. So if you're down and out and you're in Vegas, trust me, there are a lot of people here that will help you Absolutely. and get you back on the yeah. road to recovery. Because yeah. as we know, yeah. this place can spit you out. Trust me, I'm a guy that's played... You know, video kino, video poker for 20 hours straight, gone through two packs of Marlboro Lights, 37 drinks and, and, and whatever else. Right. So and I've done that before. Are you so, sober now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will say this. I'll have a glass of wine sure, here or sure. there. Understood. But yeah. yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, yeah I don't I yeah. don't drink in excess. I don't gamble in excess right. every now and then. 
I may still resort back to have a day here or there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not playing holier than thou because yeah, I'm not, I'm yeah, not yeah. that. I'm not only Jesus Christ was perfect in my book. I'll never be perfect. I'll strive to be as yeah. perfect as I can yeah. be. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm a human being and I do make a lot of mistakes. Sure. We all do. Man. And I hand that wisdom down to the younger guys yeah. like you yeah. so that they don't go down that yeah. road. Although a lot of us have to work, learn by our yeah. own hard knocks. Yeah. Right. I just sent a message to Scott like 30 minutes ago on the way over here. I said, we're all human, man. I was like, it. We make mistakes. You know, I'm working, on, I'm working on a book. Its name <laughs> is only human. Is it right? It's okay. all, on, all on athletes that have either died on the field to play or an untimely death off the field to play. And I told you earlier that I'm friends with Roberto Clemente Jr. Mm -hmm. What are the odds that I meet him by moving out to Vegas? Andy Concepcion, who's a high school baseball coach right now at the Meadows, but had on-deck baseball academy. I meet him and his dad, Ted, both from Puerto Rico. Concepcion and, is a big name. Oh, right? yeah, big yeah. day. Dave, Dave yeah, Concepcion was Dave a great Concepcion. shortstop for the Cincinnati Reds okay. back on the Big Red Machine. Yep, yep, yep. But he said, uh, he, he said, hey, I got somebody you might want to get on your show. I go, I go, okay, Andy, who is it? He goes, Roberto Clemente Jr. I go, get out of here, man. I go, I remember. Being on the beach in Florida, New Year's Eve, 1972, I was a kid and Roberto Clemente's plane goes down and that was the biggest thing. I had my dad's little white transistor radio. I'm like, oh my God, dad, ironically being a Mets fan, he dies with exactly 3000 hits. His last hit was against the Mets. Wow. And then his plane went down. They never found his body. Wow. And Manny Sanguian, who was a great catcher. I never even picked up a bat till he was 23, which will blow a lot of people's minds. And no, he's uh, like Vlad Guerrero was like the best bad ball hitter, mm -hmm. but he was phenomenal. He was a, he was a diver, uh, a cliff jumper driver, d diver from the Dominican. And he dove for Roberto's body for five hours with no tanks, nothing. Just, he was that destroyed. That's closure. how close they were. Mm. That's how close they were. Yeah. Wow. Just unbelievable. So for me and Roberto Jr. Premonition tells his dad, dad, don't take that plane. It's going to crash. And he's seven years old. And Roberto's like, oh, son, we're going to have a big Puerto Rican party. I'll be back in an hour. The little plane that he packed with all these supplies to bring to earthquake victims in Managua, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. He had loaded, uh, Paul Walker, who was a pitcher for the Pirates, was supposed to go with him. But Roberto, in his haste to get more supplies in, loaded the navigator seat. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, ah, Paul, just stay here. I'll, wow. I'll jam this stuff over there. Wow. Ironically, the supplies from Red Cross there in Managua were being stolen. By pirates. He plays for the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? Is that crazy? Yeah. So he goes, yeah. and the plane crashes and uh, the rest is history. But, I, you know, I, I meet Roberto Clemente Jr. He's actually doing the foreword to the oh, book, Only incredible. Human that's is so the name good. of the book. So in that book, what's the goal? Is it to tell the stories? Uh, is it to of all the athletes it? that have died on the field to play or in timely death off the field to play? And I use the cutoff age of 42. Okay. Ironically, Kobe dies a couple years ago, sure. 41. You is, know, there's all these... All these Can, people. Is is it in an, in in a direction towards like preserving their greatness? Is it when it, you're architecting mm -hmm. the book? Is it to tell their stories because they're fully untold? Like yes. what, what's what's, yes, what's that, the, that's a main part, but it's also for us to realize that we are indeed only human. Got it. And that was mm -hmm. the whole thing. So yep. it goes chronologically from 1920 all the way to current, mm -hmm. and there's over 350 athletes, and it blows your mind how some of these people died. Sure. And here they sure. are, like. To a lot of us, yeah. whether they're musicians mm -hmm. or athletes or entertainers, when those people die because we see them and we're like, what? And yeah. you remember Fernandez, the young pitcher for the Miami Marlins died in a boat yeah, accident yeah, a few yeah, years Miami, ago. Yeah. This kid was yeah. on top of the world, 25 yeah. years yeah. old. Yeah. And boom, all of a yeah. sudden your life's gone. Kobe Bryant, all yeah. of a sudden. I mean, I, as iconic as can be, life over. Let me ask you that because that I obviously I think a lot of people, you felt the life gets sucked out of the world when Kobe Bryant died. But yeah. we were, we, we in the office that mm -hmm. I was working at in the time here was when I was running the celebrity division at that company. Uh, when that happened, it was a suck of just energy. And so question to you because of just your fullness of knowledge and experience within the sports industry. Why do you think the world was so impacted by Kobe Bryant's death? And it was like people that weren't even sports fans mm -hmm. were coming together and thinking like, that's sad. Like how unfortunate. And it was as if he did something or demonstrated something or left this impact into people's beings that even if they weren't sports fans, they still felt it. That's monumental in my opinion. That is beyond and bigger than life. And so how, how one human being like Kobe can affect a world like that. I'm curious on what your take is. Well, on he was that. a worldly guy. Remember he grew, grew up in Italy, a lot of his mm -hmm. uh, childhood. 
right? So uh, he spoke Italian. He was mm-hmm. uh, very fluid, I think, in several languages. Uh, he was very charismatic, but his demeanor was calm. Mm-hmm. He was never afraid to take the last shot. In mm-hmm. fact, he would want that last shot. Yeah. Even in Kobe, the difference between Kobe and Michael Jordan, I always said, was Jordan will give that ball to Paxson or Kerr for the open shot, where Kobe's like, yeah, I know you're going to double me, but I could still make it. Wow. I mean, because he had that much confidence in his game. And so, yeah, when uh, when his helicopter went down, I think it, it stunned a lot of people. Now, he also showed off the court that he had made more than likely a mistake, something he would have taken back. For the most part, he lived a pretty squeaky clean life, you know, mm-hmm. family guy, all this. But again, we're all human. Mm-hmm. so. This things happen, you know, yep. things just yep. happen and it, it is what it is. So there were some people that were like, you know, that still with what happened with him allegedly in Colorado were like, well, that's what he gets. That's what he, I'm not like that. Yeah. I'm like, look, sure. the guy made a difference. Mistake. And he also yeah. helped so many people in need. He was a big time uh, philanthropist. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he just seemed like somebody that really got it, knew that he had made a mistake Mm -hmm. and would have done anything to take it back. But at the end of the day, that's all you can do is try and make amends. And I thought he did that in the, in the life that he had. And he was a great family guy. And so I think he just captured that because he's one of those people that you see him and you'd be like, Oh man, Kobe's in the room. You felt that. Mm -hmm. And Vegas of course is still an extension from Los Angeles. So there's major. And going to be even more now. And they played games here. Hollywood 2.0 is coming to Vegas. I'm telling you right now, man, it's going to be the next LA. I just got my summer league credentials to see Wembenyama, uh, the young kid from France, seven foot five, uh, went number one to the Spurs. Yeah. Yeah, So NBA summer league is great. And there's no better place for it than right here in our backyard. First pitch at the Yankees game, right? Yes, he did. Did did he? Is that what he was doing? Yes, he did. It's funny. It's it's wild how this all works, man. I've been, um, I'm obviously a diehard baseball fan because I played it all the way growing up. It kind of it saved my life, really. Right. And through college, I played, and then I and then I quit it in college because it was like I just uh, I got lost. And ever since then, I've always just paid attention to it less less. I'm not you because I'm not. That's not my life. Right. But I still watch from afar. And sure. so, what recently was was very attractive to me was Volpe. Volpe coming for in the Yankees. league. Yeah, for the yes. Yankees. Young man that came in and it's just like this underdog story, homegrown guy, diehard Yankee fan his whole life. So I'm paying attention to kind of his maturation and his growth. And so I like seeing, I love watching Judge. Obviously, Judge is just, just Fresno a State guy. My main sponsor, Brian Panish, <laughs> one of the biggest attorneys in the country, Southern California, but now here, PSBR uh-huh. Law in Vegas, uh, Brian Penny, Fresno State. So he'll make yeah. sure that you know that Aaron Judge is from Fresno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. And even that, the story, adopted kid, right? I, I believe yes. it was an adopted kid. And, Amazing, just, yeah. and, and the only Yankee yeah. I've probably ever liked. Yeah. I tell my sister, I have, <laughs> I have five sisters. Four of them are Yankee fans. Yeah. Me, my brother, and my other sister are Mets fans. Mm-hmm. And they're all Sometimes they'll be like, oh, we're rooting for your guys. To, we don't want you to root for us. Yeah. We, take your 28 rings and go somewhere. We have two rings, 1969, yeah. 1986. 86 was one of the greatest years of my life mm. when they came back and beat the Red Sox in yeah. seven games. Yeah. So yeah. I'll take it. It's been a long time yeah. since then. 94, the Rangers, that's all I got from yeah. Messier. That's the only cup there. But now I got the Golden Knights, yeah. you know, and, and I love these guys. Yeah. And Dan Duva, the voice of the Golden Knights, is a friend uh, that's come on my show. I haven't met him in person, but he's from Jersey. He's oh, a Jersey wow. boy. So we hit it off right wow. away. And you want to hear someone call a beautiful hockey game yeah. on radio yeah. where they paint the whole picture? Because mm-hmm. that's an art. Mm-hmm. Dan Duva's your man. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, Jamie, he was a uh, former San Jose Shark. Okay. And, uh, we won't hold we, that against him. Yeah, no, no, go. not at all. But uh, he does something similar. He actually, uh, 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 ringside, I believe, if, uh, what's the pro- color commentator? Sure. I color commentator yeah, would yeah, be, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy that's played um, the game, mm-hmm. and knows the game. And yep. then he may have worked with yep. my buddy, Roxy Bernstein. Roxy is uh, ESPN and uh, Pac-12 Networks, but also does work for the Sharks, the A's, because he's up in the Bay okay. Area. He okay. called Cal basketball wow. for 18 years. Right. That's his alma mater. Sure. So, yeah. It's, 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 why, it's it almost reminds me of... Um, Kind of like when you live here in Vegas and you work in the industry, right? Uh, you had all the industry knowledge. Like I was in the nightlife for, that's how I met Mark. For sure. Um, working in that excess nightclub, he was sitting at one of my tables. We just started talking and sure enough, we just, we sparked up a conversation back then. I was still exploring some different business opportunities. So I always had this, uh, young hungry hunch for talking to people that had made it. That kind of was my philosophy. But at that time in the industry, there was always like 
you know who's who of the industry and they kind of interconnect. I feel like in the sports, it's kind of the same, right? right? It's like for sure at the highest levels, there's nothing much different about the other little smaller ecosystem of something that makes it what it is, right? Um, that's pretty interesting. So I want to ask you a question about all of the study and knowledge and experience you have in all four major sports. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to derive some key characteristics about what make champions, what makes the Kobe Bryants, what makes the Derek Jeters, and I can, you know, mm -hmm. whoever you mm -hmm. want to pull out from our freshly sure. won Stanley Cup champions of the of the Golden Knights, um, you know, whether that's Mark Stone. Is there something in there that you think these people do or think that make them great at what they do that someone that's listening right now could draw into their life and make mm -hmm. something of it? Yeah, there's no doubt. And when you talk about uh, tenacity and character and you mentioned Mark Stone, 61, of course, me being born in 61, I love, I gravitate to Stoney. And uh, just that, that whole play where his stick breaks, he checks the guy grabs another stick and then gets an assist, kind of yeah. sums up who he is. He's grit. He's uh, determination. He missed 39 games. His first game back was against Winnipeg. He looked out of, out of shape. He couldn't get over to cover Dubois, who actually just signed a big contract, mm -hmm. and, and angle him. And Dubois scored, and they get buried 5-1 to one in the opener. And I'm like, oh, he's, they rushed him back just to try and have him on the ice. Mm -hmm. But lo and behold, you saw him get his stamina and help lead the cup. But yeah, that's, that, that's a gift when you have players like that, that, that go the extra mile, those first guys to practice last guys to leave. And they don't have to be, they're high, pay, highly paid. Uh, they're coveted, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you've got to want it. Chemistry is huge yeah, too. Team wise sports, team sport, and you got to buy into the coach mm -hmm. you have, but you can't have mutiny. You can't give up on a coach just because you don't agree with his methods because of maybe the way that you've grown up and you've played one way and you're like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I wanted to give up on Coach McDaniels last mm -hmm. year because the Raiders lost in their history in 60 years. They lost five games total when they led by 17 mm -hmm. or more in 60 years. Mm -hmm. Last year in their first yeah. eight games, they lost three games yeah. where they led by 17 yeah. or more. Yeah. So it was yeah. it was it was tough, especially after you had uh, was it uh, Rick, uh, Rich uh, for, for it's, it's, I'm probably butchering the, uh, the interim guy yes. that came in the year before yeah, that yeah. stepped up to be head coach. Bisaccia. 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 That's what Rich I'm Bisaccia, who's yeah. a special teams at Green Bay yeah. now. But yes, he steps in after the Henry Ruggs thing, mm -hmm. after Gruden, uh, what happened there. So you lose a coach, you lose a key player that's your speed guy from Alabama, and then you're going through all of that. And then somehow he takes over interim they go eight and five. They win their last four. They make the playoffs. They go into Cincinnati mm -hmm. and darn near beat the team that yeah. represented the AFC mm -hmm. against the Rams in the yep. Super Bowl. They, they're inside the 10 yard line with a few seconds left, yeah. lose by seven. So, yeah, I, I kind of thought it was tough on like Derek Carr's gone. Mm. I felt bad because I thought Derek never had a full deck here. Wow. And here's why wow. I say that. Yes, he played college ball at Fresno State with Devontae Adams. They're close and they worked out together. But you also had Waller and Renfro coming off all pro years. But Waller and Renfro missed 15 games between them last year. Mm. So you never had that full complement of receivers outside right. of a few games. Right. You had Josh Jacobs, who was the workhorse. Yeah. But if you had those, those guys together... And then Derek was also, you know, kind of saddled in that new offense. It was totally different. He was learning. So I kind of felt he kind of kind of got jobbed a little bit, but it's a business. Mm -hmm. And so when you have to make money decisions, that's Ziegler and McDaniels. They have to make those. Yep. Mark Davis gave them reins. Mm -hmm. So he's listening. Because trust me, I don't think Mark Davis would have wanted to get rid of Derek Carr. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. All I'll say in Derek's defense, in nine years as a Raider quarterback, their defense ranked collectively number 32. Worst in the league wow. in that nine years. Wow. They hit number 20 twice. But every other year, they were ranked worse than 20 defensively. So Jimmy Garoppolo's here. That's all well and good if Jimmy G stays healthy. But Jimmy G also has played for a 49ers team that's in the top three a in defense, defense every yeah, single year. Defense, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. and, and it's end of story. You put Derek Carr on the San Francisco 49ers, Super Bowl. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, yeah. straight up. Yeah. I think Derek with the Saints this year, because their defense has always been good and their lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball is pretty solid. Hmm. First off, New Orleans should win the NFC South. And I think that team, their schedule is rather easy as far as NFL was. But I think that team wins 11 games this mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. I'll just put that out there yeah. right now. Derek stays healthy. I think yeah. the Saints will be a big playoff yeah. team this year in the NFC. And I, th I thought I thought that the the Bucks would always, if if, if they had Tom along the mm -hmm. way, which mm -hmm. they, you, you again, I'm, a, I'm, by the way, a huge Tom Brady fan. Not because I'm from New England or from Tampa Bay, just because I appreciate how he plays the game yep. and how he wins. 
there was never a game that I watched with Tom Brady if they were down by 20 where I ever thought like this game's over. And then he'd go and prove me right where I'd be like, some bitch just came back from a 21 point deficit and they won the game, Super Bowl or not, yep. right? And so, however, anyhow, however, he is only human. And he was yeah. humbled by Peyton Manning, who finally got over the hump and beat New England when they were down 21-3 in the AFC Championship game, the year that the Colts actually beat the Bears in 2006. Uh, they won the two, in 2007, won the Super Bowl against the Bears in Florida. And uh, that's Peyton Manning. Mm-hmm. Peyton Manning being who I got, I met him at the uh, Hall of Fame. Awesome yeah, guy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have uh, Brady, who's, I mean, a seventh round draft choice, sixth or seventh round yeah, draft choice. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing story that's from that. Michigan. He, he's awesome. But yep. God will humble all of us. Mm. And who does he lose to twice? First off, he lost the biggest game in NFL history when they were 18 and 0. And they could have been the undefeated team with 16 game regular season schedule Mm. to go. Because what do we look back to? 1972 Dolphins, 17 and 0 total, 14 game regular season, two playoff games, won the Super Bowl. Only perfect team ever in NFL history. Patriots, 18 and 0, Mm. 16 and 0 regular season, won their two playoff games, play the New York Giants. Who do they lose to? A biblical name, Eli, Eli yeah. Manning. Yeah. Then Brady gets a chance for redemption a few years later. What happens? Eli beats him again. Yeah. Otherwise, Brady has two more rings wow. if it's not for Eli Manning. Wow. So for folks that don't think yeah. Eli Manning yeah. should be in yeah. the yeah. Hall of Fame, yeah. you're yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, plus he got the Manning name at that, right? Yeah, yeah. But he's, uh, you know what? He's a good player. Yes, he, yeah, he, he was. Awesome. And, yeah. and, you know, didn't Smart. have didn't have the natural ability, mm. I think, like Peyton did. And Peyton was more of the field general and, and the, the coach on the field. Mm-hmm. But Eli's pretty sharp. And his yeah. kid's pretty darn good at Texas, too. I was Keeping just going to say, he's Arch, got a kid Arch, coming up right yeah, now. Yeah, Arch, Arch Manning, although I don't think he'll start this year because uh, the, the young quarterback they have there it probably is going to beat him out, which yeah. he'll, uh, we'll see how that works out with Sarkeesian in Texas. You, you made a great point about the, the, the chemistry of the team. And I think you used the word mutiny, right? Is mm-hmm. that like a, I, I'm, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds like mutiny is when you like gang up and come again. No, oh, mutiny is no. when you go oh, against mutiny. you go against what the what that like the captain mutiny okay. on the ship. Okay. That means you all gotcha. we'll throw the captain overboard. We okay. don't believe in what he's doing. So you sometimes, and that's where I was alluding to Coach McDaniel's. Maybe we didn't agree with the New England way coming in here, but if he's got the reins for Mark Davis, we got to let it play out because. Remember, those 10 games they lost last year by one score, mm-hmm. if they win seven of those games, we're not talking about it, right? Minnesota Vikings last year had a great year, but they won seven mm-hmm. games in the last few minutes by one score, right. one score games. The Raiders were on the other side of that coin. With that point, I think about you saying it's a business, and I think that you're, if you're the, for example, all, all I can think about with the Knights was, I remember saying this to myself. I said, the Knights lost another year in the playoffs. They immediately started making changes. It's yep. like, get them out, gone, knew this. I'm thinking, man, they are not afraid to shoot from the hip type of thing. Your thought process around that, I'm curious. Like, It's almost like you have to get lucky they, to win a championship mm-hmm. because you you almost don't have enough time to build chemistry if you don't have roots in the ground, if you're always shaking yep. things up yep. to fill the pieces to make a championship team, which is what I think you're saying between what just happened. And it, ha- it happens across all leagues at no, all the time. You no, know, but you're dead on with, with the Vegas Golden Knights because you can't, when Leonard goes down prior to the season, you're scrambling. Okay. Is Logan Thompson good, good enough in between the pipes? Okay. He is great. Then he gets hurt, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Now we're in the playoffs. All right. Brassois stepped up. Oh, he's, he's won four in a row. Oh no, he's out. Aiden Hill. Okay. We got this kid, throw him in there. This guy, <laughs> unbelievable. Mm. Yes, there is luck involved. No matter what you look at, you can go back. Uh, NCAA tournament, you got to win six games, right, to win the championship when you get to March Madness. You'll go back yeah. every time there's one of those six games, I don't care who won it, that you'll look and go, man, they were lucky to come back and win that game, <laughs> right? And they never even get there if they didn't come back and yeah. win that game. And yeah. you'll go back almost every team yeah. you can do that with. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, So, yeah, definitely luck, a little bit of luck. But, yeah, sometimes you make your own breaks. And you got to step up. Look, nobody knew Aiden Hill was going to be that good in the biggest Man. situations, right? Man. The biggest yeah. spots, he came up yep. big. That's huge. I mean, March or so, you kind of felt yeah. it, but what are the odds he goes yeah. against Florida, the team that let him mm-hmm. go out there for mm-hmm. the expansion draft? So the it chills, is weird. Man. Sports, yeah, sports yeah. works yeah. like that a lot yeah. of times with life in general, yeah. and you will. It will give you chills because you go back and go, man, that's crazy how that worked out. How it all adds up. I even thought about this, too. Did you go to the parade? No, I did not. I was no. actually, I had another ob- obligation. Gotcha. So, so I, I was thinking about, because obviously the the richness of winning also has to do with how the team 
came in in the first season and the whole Route 91 festival situation. Yes. And then they make One it to October the Stanley. Tragedy, yes. Yeah, they make it to the Stanley Cup that year. And it's like, they're that close, man. Yep. I mean, you're talking about the first season. I mean, I remember sitting, I think I was in South Carolina for those last couple of games in the Stanley Cup because I was traveling and I was thinking to myself, man, this is going to be the most incredible story yep. in Vegas history ever. And it's going to make us so much more than we already are. Now we're already a sports franchise city because we've got the Knights. We've just come to the Stanley Cup. But there was a and Kobe you, type character on that Washington team named Alex Ovechkin yep, yep. that had paid That's his right. dues yep. and said, I'm yeah, this close. I'm going to win this one. I'm getting yeah, this. Yeah, I'm get, getting her, get her done. About as Larry the Cable Guy yeah. would say, get her done. <laughs> I, <laughs> I remember watching Larry the Cable Guy growing up in college, man. I was just watching him and Foxworthy. Although I just found out Fluffy's uh, going to be here Ron on my White. birthday, September 18th. My wife just said, are you a Fluffy fan? Oh my God, my I love that guy. dad's a diehard Fluffy oh, guy. That's the best. Who was the other guy that did the 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 uh, the four the four rednecks? Uh, there's Larry the Cable Guy, oh, yes, Foxworthy, uh, Jeff Ron Foxworthy? White, yeah, and Foxworthy, there was one more. Ron God, what was his name? Oh boy, yeah. We'll have to come back to that one. But yes, and I love whites. We're always with the drink. Always. Yep. Yeah, you kind of look like him. Uh, and kind of sound oh, like wow. him actually now, man. Look at that. <laughs> that's that's kind of funny. There you I, go. Please don't take it as a no, 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 that's okay. fun. no. He's a character. Wish but, I had his money, but he's. He, hey, man, you know what? You could. Yeah, I, I will. One day. Not his, but yeah, I'll have yeah, my own. yeah, right, right. <laughs> the the thought that came to me based on that whole parade comment was that. The five that you look at that, you know, kind of brought it home. There's more than that on the team, obviously. Right. But the six misfits were left yeah, from the, the expansion six, team. Correct. Right. The others that were there for that first season, kind right. of imagining how they were feeling and thinking, man, we were so close. We could have been that. The glory in that victory. I mean, that's, I, I was telling my fiance, I was like, that's got to be the most incredible feeling in the world in a city like this for that result. Um, but anyway, man, look. Uh, time flies. Well, time flies. This was so much fun. We're definitely doing another one. Um, I'm going to ask you what I always ask. This is like my last and final question, but okay. we didn't even get a chance to unpack a thousand percent of what we could have because I could sit here and ask you questions around sports and life just out of curiosity. And I know you'll run with them. And I'm having the time of my life in yeah, this conversation. I, I love man. It. This is so much fun. You're great though uh, too with uh, spontaneity. That's what Larry King said. And that's what I do on my radio show. I don't prepare as far as, I mean, I prepare, I yeah. know, yeah. but I never tell any of my yeah. guests questions or no. anything. We might just have no. topics, a yep. couple bullet points, yep. but that's it. We yeah. go. And these guys are on it. That's it, man. It makes for yeah, the best yeah. radio. You for can, sure. Yeah. You can, you, I'm just curious. And if you say something, I'm always thinking, oh, I don't know anything about that. Let me, let me understand it. Maybe somebody else might get the same value out of it that I do. And then I might think about, okay, well, that was, that was pretty cool, but I don't want to let that go. So let's bring it back. Let's, let's keep talking about that type of thing. And that's it. You just, you just don't know. Yeah. Right. I think that's the beauty of it. it. Is, um, it is. So obviously shows, shows called always on the grow, Ken. I mean, okay. I've got to ask you, what does that mean to you? <clears throat> and you'll have to change your answer for the next time we do another show together. No, no. Uh, <laughs> always on the grow because at 61 now I'm still growing and I need to grow. And whether you're in Las Vegas or anywhere, but since we call Vegas home, this place, you can hit your highest high and you can hit your lowest low. And there's some people that have hit their lowest low and didn't make it out of Vegas. Hmm. Uh, always on the grow means day to day for me. You have to go day to day because if you go too far in the future, you may never get there. Hmm. Hmm. And so I, I, I like it. Always on the grow. I, I continue to grow each and every day. I've hit some low points to where I second guess myself. But then when I sit down here and I speak with you, I know all the paths that I've gone down and all the yogiisms like Yogi Berra would have, or when you get to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> and I thought about that. I go, here I am, fork in the road. What do I do? Take it. Take the fork. Take it's the like, fork. Funny, isn't it? Funny. That's but, brilliant. Uh, you know what? Always on, I'm telling you, always on the grow. I am truly trying to grow as a person, mm -hmm. but there are times like I said, where I second guess myself and this and that, but I think you have to stay with that all the time. In fact, that's a great tattoo. I always on the grow. I should have it like right there to remind me when I feel those doubtful thoughts that I need to know, nope, keep growing, yeah. keep growing. It's just another, another avenue to just keep growing on. Yeah. So I love it. I think it's uh, Manny Vargas. I think he got a great show and I, I think it's uh I didn't mean to hijack it, but that's who, that's Dude, who no, I am. No, no, it's, it's your show, man. I'm, I'm just here to, to, to create the space, right? By the way, what you said there, I think the best part about what you just said was the day-to-day -day piece yep. because you're right. You can get caught up in five-year plan. And I understand those in business context, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, 
I know this so well, Ken, because I was the victim of doing that where I thought, oh, I want to make $50 million. And then I wasn't doing the things every day that were going to get me to 5 million, to 10 million type of thing. I got you. And then I realized, oh, I got to change the narrative, right? Completely. And then you said something else there that just made me think about the last and final thing. And then we'll wrap up. You mentioned the Rio a lot today. We're right next to it, right behind, kind of in front of it right here. Right. Um, the other day, I'm doing this new, this new version of uh, content creation where I go out around town, I pop up and I'll do a, like a little mini presentation randomly and teach a lesson or a life uh, story or something along those lines. So we went to the Rio and did it on the rooftop of the uh, garage. And uh, the only thing I had going on in my head the whole the time was- The old voodoo lounge, I remember. Not that, that tall, not that high. Okay. I'm talking about the, the parking garage. Oh, okay. Because the Vegas drop is right behind it. But you learn some stuff. Uh, it, was too, it was too sunny facing this way. Lighting was all messed up. So we actually faced the Rio. Anywho, my point is, you mentioned the voice, the self-doubt, getting the tattoo. Mm -hmm. It's so important to understand that because we all have that. And if, if you don't push through that piece right there, you don't ever have the chance to expose yourself to what life could become. And the whole time we were driving over there, it's like security is going to beat us up. This is going to be a problem. Right. We're not going to get it done. The little voice, the little voice, sure. the little voice. And we did it. And then after you do it, you feel like you're on top of the world. No so doubt. that's great. Great said, man. Very, very, very well said, brother. Man, I'm, I can't wait till next time, man. I, you know it's what? I appreciate fun. it. And yeah. I pray, I thank Mark Advent for, uh, uh, you know, giving me your number. So yeah. I'm able to connect with you yeah. and my daughter, Kiara, who's 22 now. I learn from the, I don't, I'm not one of those older guys that looks at the young generation and go, I know more than them because I've lived longer. Right. No, right. I learn a lot yeah. from the younger generation Absolutely. because they've grown up with cell phones and computers and things like we didn't grow mm -hmm. up. So that's why you'll see a lot of us older, lazy people like here, here's my phone, do that. No, I'd rather learn from her. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to take you four times to show me before I get it yeah, down. Yeah. But I'd rather yeah. learn that yeah. from the younger generation because you have your yeah. younger generation yeah. has a lot to give. Amen, man. It's a two way street. I feel that completely. I feel that you all similarly have the wisdom of the years lived that yep. you can't, I can't make that up. Like I can't forecast into it. I just have to borrow from someone like you that can share it with me and then vice versa. Exactly. It's just, it's just kind of a inverse effect. And so it's a win-win, man. Vegas style. Right on. Manny Vargas, right <laughs> on, brother. Bless, I appreciate man. you, man. Yeah, Thank you so much. Very cool, man. All right.